Hi, my name is Sean Daly, and I am the creator of books like Better Place, Tarek Will, Samurai Grandpa, and the upcoming Lost Souls. You can find me on Twitter at Sean Daly or Instagram at Sean underscore Daly, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a first-time guest. I was supposed to have him back on a month ago. Situations happened. He's back on now. That's the most important thing for this particular interview. He's a very talented comic artist as well as a music creator as well, too. Love his stuff, by the way. We're joined today by the ever talented Sean Daly. How are you doing today, Sean? Good, man. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. A person that is creative like you are has a lot of outlets for his creativity, which is wonderful to see. How did you get into both comics and music? Well, music I got into, I think, when I was around uh, like 16 or 17 or so. And that's like making music is why I kind of got into all that stuff. And it started off with like a video game music because I had grown up listening to video game music my entire life, just being a huge uh, game fan. Uh, and that hasn't changed, which is nice. But uh, I just, yeah, I loved it. It was kind of the first music that I fell in love with as, uh, as a kid. So when I figured out that, you know, you can create this music using just like basically a computer. Uh, I just went for it and just it never ended, I guess. <laughs> and now there's this big library of music and these games uh, that I've scored. So uh, it's been a ton of fun, but comics wasn't something that I jumped into until later in life. Like my early twenties, I think is when I first got into making uh, or reading comics. And it was kind of the same thing. I just fell in love with it. And I was like, wait, I could do this maybe like if I just like put in the work and like figured it out um, and I did and I don't know here I am just like still doing it and I love it it's like the best one of the best outlets I've ever had for anything so what was the first comic that you you looked at that you were you were blown away by that was Chester Brown's Louis Riel which is mm -hmm. a Canadian historical comic when I read that for the first time I was like wait like comics aren't just like these single issues that you find on a rack in a convenience store, which is not a bad thing because after I read Louis Riel, I went to the comic store and bought <laughs> all the small issues that I could find of anything that looked interesting. But after Louis Riel, I read Watchmen, which I think is like a, a pretty solid entry point for anybody who's interested in comics in some way. Uh, it's like a good direction to go in. And then after that, it was like all bets were off. I was just... <laughs> Just every Wednesday at the shop, just buying way more than I could afford, way more than I had time to read. And it just, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it was, I have very fond memories of uh, comics in my early 20s. I was going to say the the rabbit hole is ever, <laughs> ever deepening when it comes That's, to comics. That's and it, yeah. You know, you walk into your local comic book store and they know you by name. That's either a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hopefully good. <laughs> Hopefully always good. As an artist yourself, then, what is the most difficult part about being an artist? The beginning, the middle, or the end? Oh, man. It's a hard one. Uh, the most difficult thing about being an artist is struggling with, like, a... a and I can obviously only speak for myself, but struggling with, you know, a bit of the self-doubt that comes with uh, being an artist because it's hard. Sometimes you, you, uh, you question every decision that you make, every line that you make, every uh, paint stroke, like everything. You're always, there's a lot of self-doubt in, in making art. And that is with anything, like with comics, with music. Uh, and I'm sure it's the same thing with just about any other medium, but I would say struggling with like the, yeah, the self-doubt is like the hardest thing about being an artist, which I don't know. I, I don't know if that ever goes away, to be honest. Uh, but I do think that there are ways to learn how to use it to your advantage and to let that kind of do some of the work for you. Um, I'm still figuring it out myself, but, you know, maybe someday, <laughs> maybe someday. So what tips have you found for yourself that has lessened the doubt? 
learning how to move on when something isn't working instead of just like being hung up on it and just like looking at the page and being like, you know, what am I doing? I, I can't do this. This isn't going to work. Sometimes you just have to uh, move on to something else for a little bit. And for me, that might be music for two or three hours. And then after that, hit the page again, and then I'm feeling good about it. Like the self-doubt is kind of a bit like a, just a downward spiral. If you don't get out of that early, you might waste and obviously I'm, I'm saying, I mean me, like I might waste two hours staring at a page and not making any good progress. But if I can like pull myself out of that early, I can spend those two hours doing something else and then feeling good about getting back to it. So I, I feel like the best thing you can do is to understand when that's happening and then to act on it. Speaking of comics, then, you know, looking at your, your wide litany of comics that you have created here. What was the first comic that you got asked to be an artist? Oh, oh man, that would have been a comic in maybe 2015. And to be honest, I can't even remember the name of it. It was just kind of like a single issue. It was my first paid full issue gig. It might have been called Sam Sarah. In fact, I think that's exactly what it was called. It might have had a subtitle as well, but... It was kind of this epic space opera that was maybe a little bit sword, too grandiose for where I was at. at at that time. I don't think I was all that capable of, you know, seeing a space opera to, to its full completion. And it was fun. Like I learned so much about it, but it was definitely the first comic that I was like, oh, like I'm getting paid to do this. This might actually be a career and something I can move forward with. The first comic that I think maybe people have read that uh, I was paid to draw would have probably been Samurai Grandpa because that was shortly after Terrible. That had a fairly successful Kickstarter as well for it. So yeah, I think Samurai Grandpa would be the first one that people might know. Do you enjoy the sam Samurai genre? I do. I love it. Um, I absolutely love it. Uh, from what I read, I mean, I, there was a tweet not that long ago saying like we need more samurai comics out there because like there are you know enough but there or there are a lot but there's not enough and i agree with that which is why i mean easton and i the easton is the writer of samurai grant but we both um grew up enjoying the same things um a lot of anime and a lot of manga and a lot of media from japanese cultures and we just really wanted to do something in that vein and kind of celebrate the stuff that we loved. And that's kind of like where Samurai Grandpa came from. Um, and I don't know how much I could say, but there will actually be um, another volume of that um, with more information on that, like later this year, but it, it's the same thing. It's just like, we love this stuff. <laughs> like we, we just want to tell stories uh, with certain ethos and certain things that we were influenced by. So, uh, yeah, like we both love Samurai comics, obviously. I hope that's obvious. Better Place then is your, one of your newer comics that you've, you've put together as well too, being published by IDW and Top Shelf, of course. Tell us the story behind that. And as an artist, what did you learn from that comic? Oh, I learned a lot from Better Place. And a lot of what I learned was in the editing stage because once the book was done and we had submitted it, we got to work with the top shelf editing team and they just went above and beyond to make sure that everything was as good as it could be. And I like, I value that experience so much. It was one of the coolest things that I'd ever, and most interesting and most educational processes I've ever had in my career in comics. That was just looking at how these, the editors just, picked everything apart and I don't mean that in a bad way it was incredible the amount of work and their attention to detail so yeah like just that entire editing process was was wild and I I hope that I learned a lot from it uh, enough from it that I could bring that to the books that I work on in the future um, and it really just goes to show how important good editors are and that they don't get the credit that they deserve um, when you see edited by someone's like that name should be huge. <laughs> it's <laughs> such a big, big part of the process. Um, but the entire process was amazing. I mean, working with Dwayne, who's just such an awesome writer and who has such a good eye for 
storytelling and characters, his sensibilities are a lot like mine. I think we share a lot of sensibilities. We want emotional stories uh, around characters who feel like real people. And that's exactly what he did with Better Place. The whole process was just fantastic. I wish I could do it all over again, but <laughs> that, that's a one and done. And I'm glad that it is. The themes in that particular book, obviously, are, are fairly deep. And it's a grandiose story in itself, especially when it comes to, to loss and everything like that. Uh, as an artist, then, how specifically did you try to tailor the art style to fit the themes of the book? So initially... The art style approach was just, I'm going to do the usual. Uh, the book was going to be, was always going to be in black and white with some splashes of color, which is Wayne's, um, quite honestly, brilliant idea. It worked out so well. Um, but knowing that it was going to be in black and white, uh, that was how I learned how to draw, was uh, in black and white with ink washes and kind of just like a very loose inky style. And so I figured, well, I would tackle the book with that style moving forward and just, you know, try and really refine it over the process. But um, Dwayne hired me because of that style, because he thought that thematically that look would suit um, the, the story that he was telling. So thankfully I didn't need to change anything because the style was chosen for the purpose of, of this book, um, which was nice. It was nice working with somebody who was like, Whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. I don't want you to change anything, uh, which is good to hear as a cartoonist, as an artist working on a book. Uh, the last thing you want to hear is, okay, I'm hiring you for this book, but you got to change everything that you're doing. It's like, well, why'd you hire? <laughs> uh, unless they just wanted you for the name. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Which, I mean, fine, but like, uh, we're, we're artists. Like, we develop these styles. We want to do our thing, you know? A collaborative effort. Not only with Better Place, but with, of course, Lost Souls and everything else that you have done as well, too. What's the most important quality about working with a writer as an artist? For me, it's having a little bit of freedom with the script and being able to read it and say, to, to offer like constructive feedback before anything is drawn. Like I, I guess to be able to make slight little itsy bitsy changes to suit my uh, drawing and storytelling style. It's hard when a writer sends a script and they're like, this is the script, this is it, it has to be drawn this way. And nothing can be changed or no liberties can be taken. But if I'm working with somebody like Easton or Dwayne or Bob Sally from Ogres and Ogre, they sometimes will send these very loose descriptions of just what needs to be on there. Like uh, there was one, two or three script pages in Ogre that just said fight. And I was like, all right, <laughs> like, I guess I get to have fun with that. And, and that's kind of what I appreciate working with writers is, and it goes both ways as well. If I send them art, I want them to be able to say, actually, you know, would you mind trying this or doing something else? And like, I don't mind that one single bit. Because uh, like you said, it's a collaboration, like it, it's back and forth. It needs to kind of be this open-ended process and like obviously you don't want to spend too much time on one thing going back and forth and then you know you've wasted uh, too much time on it but uh, knowing to choose and pick when that happens I think is like a good skill to know as well but for me yeah I, I love the freedom of just being able to say hey this panel um, works great but what if we kind of change it to this instead and yeah having that freedom it's very important as a creative person, not only as an artist and as a musician that you are here, what's the most misunderstood aspect about either of those job titles? <laughs> artist and musician. Interesting. Most misunderstood thing about those job titles. That's a, that's a really hard question to answer because I'm so involved in being an artist and being a musician that I can't really remember a time in my life where in my adult life, at least, that I've had the perspective of looking on those two jobs without being involved in them in some way. Um, so it's hard from an outside perspective to say one way or the other, but I guess, sorry, that's a really challenging one. That's, that's, that's actually a very good question. I've never, <laughs> never uh, heard that one before. I try. Yeah, <laughs> you try well. I think that you could look at 
both of being an artist and a musician and really anything to do with art of any kind, performance art, visual art, whatever you have. I think that a lot of people look at it as, uh, and I just had this conversation with a friend of mine. A lot of people might look at it like, oh, this person is like, you know, trying to make it or turn it into a career, which might be the case in a lot of cases. But um, I think that for a lot of us, like we're doing this because we feel like we have to. Uh, and in a way, I can only speak for myself, obviously, but for me, making comics and music is almost like a type of therapy where I get a lot of my thoughts and a lot of my insecurities and a lot of my frustrations out either onto the page or into a song or onto an album. And for me, it helps in such a big way that like nothing else in my life has helped with. Um, and yeah, it's, it's amazing. I'm not just kind of doing this to make a paycheck. That is nice. And I'm glad that I get to pay my rent that way. But if I wasn't getting money for it, I would still be doing it. And not just for fun, but because I feel like I would have to. So I guess a common misconception would be that people who do this only look at it like a job. When really, I think that for a lot of us, it's so much more than that. And it's even so much more than a hobby. It's like something that helps our minds. Like it's good for our mental health. And I think that's why a lot of people make art. Then what is your creative kryptonite? <laughs> no, uh, video games. <laughs> that's no, that, yeah. that's not a, that's not a kryptonite. That's I mean, a pleasure. That's true. I'm not. Yeah, a hundred percent. But when they add up and <laughs> and all you can think about is uh, getting a few levels in in Final Fantasy XIV, uh, <laughs> that page doesn't look as uh, appealing. So the good thing about that is I can kind of write that off in a way as, uh, oh, I have to do some research on, uh, on JRPGs or I need to study some uh, that game soundtrack, so I'll you know, play it for a little bit. So, you know, there are ways, but the thing is there are so many games coming out every month. I'm, you know, neck deep in Shin Megami Tensei five right now. And the new Pokemon game is coming out in a week. And then after that, it's Horizon uh, Forbidden West. You know, everything's stacking up. And it's just like, oh, no, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I feel like gaming is, I mean, and I'm, I try to be responsible about it, obviously. Like, comics and work on music is my job. And I treat it like a job. Very important. But it's hard to turn down a good, uh, you know, three-hour Final Fantasy session sometimes. <laughs> What's larger your your gaming backlog or your comic backlog for reading? Oh, gaming backlog for sure. Uh, and I say that because there are games from like the PS3 era that I haven't played yet. Like games like Bioshock or Portal, like these very, I know, right? <laughs> That's what I mean. It's like, there are these amazing, amazing games that I just have not gotten around to play because they're just being released so quickly these days. And like, even like I, I don't have an Xbox, but I hear that Game Pass is like amazing. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I, I've been thinking about it for a while, but then the backlog just got so much bigger. Uh, I do have PlayStation Plus, which already has like, you know, probably eight years of backlogged games, like hundreds of games just like waiting there um, to be played. So I would say the yeah, I mean, the comic backlog is huge as well which is quite concerning when you consider what that means for the gaming backlog. But yeah, just never ends, which I love. I love just being able to pick and choose like what mood am I in? Oh, there's something for that. What was the first comic book that made you cry? Oh man. That's a, that's a hard call. That's actually not something I've ever thought about. I'm guessing it would have been reading Sweet Tooth for the first time. Uh, it's just such a wonderfully beautiful, sad story. Yeah, I think it would have been Sweet Tooth, which might be why Jeff Lemire inspired my style so much, especially early on when I was uh, when I was learning. Uh, obviously, he's inspired. I think my storytelling style as well, because like I love those sad stories. I love the emotional uh, story. I just. If, if I'm writing a story or working on a book that 
uh, just make somebody, you know, feel something like very emotional or just like shed a single tear, like job, job's done. <laughs> That's kind of, I need a little bit of that in everything that I work on. And I don't know how I would feel about that if I hadn't read, you know, his, his work early on. So I always really appreciate that. What's better, uh, bone or sweet tooth? Mm. <laughs> Two very different uh, <laughs> comics. I remember growing up reading Bone, like the comic strip Bone. I definitely grew up reading Bone and I enjoyed it. But I'd say Sweet Tooth is much closer to uh, my own sensibilities. You know, speaking of emotions, do you think someone could be a creative person if they didn't feel emotions? No. <laughs> I think that they could try to, but I think it would be like AI generated art where it's like, mm. yeah, they're making art, but are they being creative? And honestly, that's like a completely different conversation. Um, <laughs> which I don't know if I'm qualified to jump into, but sure. I really don't think that if somebody could feel emotions that they could be creative. Well, oh man, that's a good one too. Uh, I'm, I'm going to double down and just say, I don't think so. I, I think that a very important part of being creative is feeling emotions. Uh, and that might not even be like good emotions, you know, and that's a good one. Do you believe in creative block yeah i do i know that there's some discussion around that it's not really a thing but i mean i definitely think it is i just think we all kind of define that differently i know that when i'm sitting down to work on a page or even a single panel if my mind isn't in the right place i get stuck and i get like really stuck to the point where like i mentioned before i need to like walk away or take a bit of a break and I don't think that there, obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just literally considered part of the process is stepping away and taking time. But I definitely think creative block is a thing more important for me anyways, than understanding how to draw and understanding what little I know about anatomy and lighting and all these things. It doesn't matter how much I've studied and how much I know. If I sit down and my mind is a bit foggy or there's things kind of weighing it down, I won't be able to draw well. And to me, that's a form of creative block where I need to do something else to just kind of decompress or get that out, out of there. There's definitely creative block. And I I'll also don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think you kind of need that sometimes. It can result in you walking away for a little bit, which we, we all need once in a while. So yes, I think there is creative block. And I don't actually think that there's anything like wrong with it or too much bad about it. If you use it properly, it's like a tool. Before I get into my more introspective questions, even though I have touched upon some of them, <laughs> is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? We'll, we'll talk about your social media work and where, where we can find you at the end of the interview. Um, I don't think so career wise. I'm just looking at, my placing, if there's anything that stands out that might be fun to... Well, you mentioned magic. Do you play magic? Are you... A... Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I love it. Uh, which is why I have your, your photo down there in your lower third with the magic symbol. Oh, yeah. On your hat yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's something I'm always uh, happy to touch on. Over, overrated, underrated Magic the Gathering edition. <laughs> I love it. So we're going to talk... We're going we're gonna to talk about the colors specifically. Okay. All right, overrated, underrated edition, Magic the Gathering. Overrated, underrated, red. <laughs> I'm going to say red is a little bit... Oh, and there's no middle ground? Oh, that's a hard one. Oh, no, you, you can say perfectly rated if you like. Okay. I mean, um, we're going to judge you anyhow. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I think red is actually maybe a little bit overrated. Um, Why is that? <laughs> okay hold on now that now that you've asked that i'm starting to question myself uh and so you haven't played in like four years is that it, yeah yeah it's been since um yeah it's been a while yeah. but um because yeah i some of the colors have changed slightly <laughs> for better or worse since then um, it's odd yeah which yeah like it is quite odd um so they, so they don't have, they have the standard colors. They do have all the, the colors are the same. Um, 
but each color, not each color, but red in particular, which is why this is like kind of making me think, has really leaned into a mechanic called treasures, which mm-hmm. oh yeah 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 the, the artifact that you can sacrifice for one yeah. color. And so, like, Red is really leaned into that, which has given it kind of its own form of ramp, which is good. And so I think that um, I'll change my answer to underrated um, <laughs> for, for Red because it's more capable than ever, uh, I think, uh, now that it has its own kind of, like, built-in mana ramp. And the fact that it's also an artifact synergizes with Red's artifact, you know, synergy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's my right answer. I think maybe a little bit underrated. How about blue? Blue is probably a little bit overrated, to be honest, because like it can basically basically do anything. Um, and I think that countering a spell is like the strongest thing that a magic card can do. You can almost basically pay two blue to have your opponent skip their turn, essentially. If the spell that they're playing is like a you know huge part of their strategy and they mm-hmm. spent all their mana on it. So but at the same like and that is good, but at the same time, I think that maybe on its own, it's just not, you know, up to to par for other colors. It's a lot of fun and very frustrating, but <laughs> Yeah, the uh, very first deck I ever created was a goblins deck. It was all red. It was a, basically a smash and smash and burn type deck. Yeah, um, just very quick, uh, yeah. quick damage. Yeah, yeah, it was it was fun. Don't oh wrong, for but, sure. I, no, I'm not taking anything away from that. Okay. Yeah, those decks are fun. <laughs> but but then I faced um, a blue white like stifling deck that just it was just, it was just disgusting. It was it, just like okay, I just did all this for no reason right yeah uh, yeah those decks that just stop you from playing the game are yeah. are their own brand of evil i think there, there there's a certain a circle in hell for <laughs> yeah exactly people, i'm sure <laughs> yeah, yeah uh next color let's go with white white is i mean definitely under every other color seems to do the things that white does but better i think mono white is a really hard deck to play and i've done it and i don't love it there are, are probably better decks out there than the ones that i've built so <laughs> i think white still has a long way to go before it's kind of viable competitively at least uh, on its own let's go with black black is probably over for me i think actually no it's under <laughs> it's 100 percent it's very good it's probably my favorite mono color to play just because i feel like Obviously, no other color interacts with graveyards and life gain or life loss as well as black does. The creatures that exist within black are some of my favorite, like zombies and vampires and rats and so on. Like, those are all black creatures. And they're, like, so much fun uh, to play, uh, especially tribally. So, yeah, it's black fun. Then the final color is green. I mean, it's the strongest color on its own, like... I purposefully do not play green because it's just like, for me, it's like playing the game on easy mode. It just can do everything like perfectly. Uh, It has big creatures. It has tons of ramp, tons of land. The only thing it doesn't do is artifacts because it doesn't need to. Like it can do all the things that powerful artifacts do. But the thing is, if you want to throw artifacts in green deck, you can, and then it's just even better. So... (laughs) Uh, yeah, green is definitely. Would it be overrated if it's like too strong? To, to a point, I think it would be. I mean, yeah. I, I faced too many green decks in Friday Night Magic before. It was just like, <laughs> how am I going to deal with this? Yeah. I just have a red deck. Well, I'm screwed. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to scoop now and go on to the next? Yeah, game? exactly. Yeah, that's basically how it works. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on the path to where they are today. Who was that for you? kind of hate to keep talking about the guy, but Lemire definitely inspired me in a big way. I used to see him in my local comic shop back when it was around 2013 until it closed a few years after that. And I, he was always just such a nice guy and he let me pick his brain about different uh, pens and brushes and papers and material back when I was like first experimenting with learning how to draw and just getting started. So not only was he uh, an, in, uh, an inspiration artistically with storytelling, but 
just such a stand up nice guy. And I always uh, appreciated him for that. Um, and I try my best to like pay, pay that forward anytime anybody, you know, has their own comic questions or they're first getting started and, and wanting eyes on their stuff. Definitely um, Jeff for that. And then life-wise, I would probably have to say my mother because she was just such a, and always has been just very much, you know, a huge, a huge support through, through everything. She kind of never told me that I couldn't do something like, you know, she was very uh, encouraging and still is. So uh, I don't know if I would be able to do it, have been able to have done it with, without um, her support. And so, yeah, thanks for giving me two <laughs> options there. So that's a hard one to choose. From a professional perspective, you've created multiple comics. You are an artist, you are a musician, you've done many things creatively that you are professionally successful in. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do. I do because when I sit down to write a story or to sit down to draw a story, when that's done, I'm able to look at it and for the most part, feel like I did it to the best of my ability or that the message is as clear as it can be. And to me, that is um, success to be able to take these thoughts and this, you know, these weird worlds and characters that exist in my head and to put them down onto a page in a clear way that other people can consume and read and get something from. And when I do that, I just feel like I won. Like this is, you know, I, I had this idea, I got it down, I put it out into the world. And to me, that is success. Um, I guess you could say just completing the projects that I do is to me is considered success. Whether or not anyone reads them, that's a different story, but that wouldn't affect my view of what I would consider to be successful. Yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I am. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I've gotten pretty good at accepting when something has, you know, failed and trying to just move on and to treat it like a learning experience, which I think is obviously the most important part of failure is it's not that you didn't do the thing. It's that you learned a little bit more about how to do it successful next time or the time after that and the time after that, et cetera. So I feel like approaching failure as its own success. <laughs> and I know that sounds a little bit weird, but if you can like figure out how to look at failure as something that you've learned from, uh, I don't think it's that bad of a thing. It's actually a completely necessary thing. I failed many times. I've sent pitches that haven't gotten picked up. I've drawn pages and written stories that haven't seen the light of day because I wasn't happy with them. But each one has been kind of practice for the next. Uh, and I hope that that never changes. It sounds weird, but like I hope that there are many more failures <laughs> in <laughs> in my career so that I can continue to learn and just kind of get better. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an artist, a writer, a musician, maybe, or whatever they would like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? They just have to create, basically do what the generation that they're looking at does, because I think that they have to do it in their own way um, and based on who they are. As a, somebody making music and comics professionally, I uh, obviously didn't start doing this professionally. It was all done for fun. And it was done for fun because I was watching other people doing it, whether or not they were getting paid or they were having fun. It, that didn't matter. What mattered was me enjoying it. Um, and I think that if anybody out there is kind of getting into this or deciding that they want to turn music or comics into a career, they can do it. And you should. And you should try to do it. But the best way to start doing that is to do it for fun and do it because you love it. Because this is not a job that you want to wake up and do and just kind of have it feel like work every single day. Like this is a job that uh, music and working in comics, these are like fun jobs that I wouldn't want to do if, if I wasn't enjoying them. 
Well, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You survived an interview, so thank you <laughs> That's so great. for that. I, oh, thank I you greatly for, appreciate it. Thank you for uh, the awesome, really inquisitive questions. Um, they were, yeah, it was great. It was fun just being able to talk about this. And yeah, I really appreciate uh, you having this platform to do that. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you on social media? Uh, Twitter is where I'm at usually the most, which is just at Sean Daly. Uh, I spend a lot of time on Instagram posting artwork and screenshots. And that's Sean underscore Daly. I do have a Patreon uh, account where I kind of post early art access and a lot of behind the scenes stuff from the books that I'm working on. And I will be posting um, the next Terraquil book there uh, online for all patrons. Um, as the stories get done over this year. So uh, yeah, Patreon is probably a good place to check out as well. But usually Twitter and Instagram are like the two big ones. Um, I do have a website, but I don't really update it that often. It's just so much easier to to connect with people on social media anyway. So that's, yeah, that's where I like to be. As I say every week, Everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Of course, you can find this interview and a thousand others on our website, tgtmedia.com, or, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. Thanks for everyone for listening, watching over the years, and tune in next week for another great interview on Two Geeks Talking.